to set up our time together, I want to, uh, I want to start by being honest. When we start talking about the topic of supernatural healing, it can be awkward. Yes, it can be awkward. The discussion brings about so many personal convictions because there are people who are highly skeptical of supernatural healing and people really struggle to believe that God will heal us when we're sick, when we're injured, or we're facing death. How many of you have ever prayed for God to heal you or someone that you care about? Okay. Other people, though, are entrenched in a fundamental belief that the gift of healing died with the apostles. And so if God chooses to heal someone today, it happens in a very private way, very private way. And then there are those who believe in holding huge gatherings with people that have the gift of healing and they lay hands on you to cure you. And I'm sure there are plenty of people, maybe some of you even in the room, that are somewhere in between or in the middle of these various ideas or beliefs on supernatural healing, right? I'm sure if we sat down and polled each and every one of you, you would have various ideas or skepticisms or uncertainties about this topic. So I think it's important that we're just legit about that before we start this conversation today. And here's what I want you to understand. Here, watch this. Part of why we have so many various viewpoints on this is due in large part to how we have been conditioned both inside and, watch, outside of the church. We've been conditioned on this. There have been controversial teachings, studies, and sermons preached on this topic. And there have been, look, I'll own it. I'll say it, there have been abuses, manipulations, and an incalculable amount of money taken from people, all in the name of healing. Documentaries, movies, and books have all been made mainly intended on exposing individuals who have been well known for their manipulation and deceit. And so from the From the early 1970s all the way to the early 2000s, the discussion of super... Here, this is so big. Watch this. This is how interesting this is. The discussion of supernatural healing has been woven into the fabric of American pop culture. American pop culture. All of that, plus terrible biblical exposition at times has created a huge amount of skepticism. And I think it's good that we acknowledge it. I think it's good that we recognize here that on one hand, it's almost comical how ridiculous some of this has been, right? Like if you've ever seen some of these videos on YouTube or you've seen some of these people that have been caught or called out for manipulating people and taking their money all in the name of healing, and you see some of the ways that that goes down, it's almost comical, But on the other hand, on the other hand, it's important to shed light on how this topic can bring pain to people. Because maybe, here, look at me, maybe you've prayed the hardest you've ever prayed for God to show up in a moment. And from your perspective, he didn't. And that pain That pain's real. So I think we've got to be honest about that. Countless families have buried their loved ones believing that if they had just a little more faith, if they had prayed just a little harder, if they'd given just a little bit more money, their family member or their friend would be alive today. And so the discussion of supernatural healing can can bring a flood of emotions. It can bring a flood of beliefs and convictions and doubts. And so here, watch. This is for everybody in the room. No matter where you stand on this topic, no matter where you stand on this topic, what we cannot deny is the fact that Jesus did heal a lot of people during his ministry. Amen? Amen. And the apostles did, in fact, heal people everywhere they went preaching the gospel. Amen? 
And maybe you have a personal story or a testimony of how you've seen or heard or experienced healing. So what do we make of all of this? Like if we really start talking about this topic of supernatural healing, I mean, it's really opening a can of worms. And in some church circles, it is part of Pandora's box. We just don't talk about it. Keep the lid on, man. Well, the reality is that this is actually a really big discussion. And of course, we're not gonna be able to say all that there is to say today, okay? Can you, can you just acknowledge that with me? I mean, we're gonna swing for the fences here, but I mean, we might come up short. We might, you know, if we get 375 on this and, and a, a double, I'll be tickled, right? But we gotta figure out what we're doing here, okay? We're gonna continue to approach this in the best way we can as we journey through Luke because we wanna learn the most about his ministry. And part of Jesus' ministry was that he healed. And so it matters, it matters, it matters. And hopefully by God's good grace after today, we will gain a more clear understanding of what the Bible actually teaches on healing. All right, we ready to jump in? Okay, do I need security to run a sweep to see if you've got any rocks or tomatoes that you're not just going to start chucking those things up here? I want to make sure we're all on board for the journey, okay? I'm not looking to make anybody mad today, but I might. In which case, just email Jason. He'll catch up with it, okay? So go ahead and open your Bibles, gang, to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. We use the CSB Bible. Again, you're welcome to run to the back there and grab one from Brooke at our welcome home table. We'd love for you to have one. If not, you can follow along on a device, but would love for you to have a Bible today. Love for you to have a Bible. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 17. We're going to be focusing on verses 11 through 19, okay? That's where we're going to be camping out, 11 through 19. So let's read together. Let's, let's look at the text together as I read it out loud. It says, while traveling to Jerusalem, verse 11, he passed between, talking about Jesus, Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, 10 men with leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance, and they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Verse 14. When he saw them, Jesus sees them, he told them, go and show yourself to the priests. And while they were going, watch, they were cleansed. What? Verse 15. But one of them, seeing that he was healed, returned with a loud voice and gave glory to God. And he fell face down at his feet, thanking him, thanking Jesus. And he was a Samaritan. Oh boy, is that important. Verse 17, then Jesus said, we're not 10 cleansed. It's like Jesus is like, I'm running the math here. I think there were 10 of you, right? Where are the other nine? Didn't any return to give glory to God except this foreigner? Which by the way, if you're the Samaritan, it's a little like, slow down, Jesus. Like, I mean, come on. I'm standing right here, bro, right? Verse 19, and he told him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has saved you. So, uh, gang, there's a lot to unpack here, okay? There's a lot to unpack. So, let's start with leprosy, which is a great way to start off any conversation. Um, <laughs> you remember the uh, Debbie Downer uh, skits from SNL? You know, wah, wah. Like, I always think about that when I say, did you hear about leprosy? I'm like, good Lord, you know? Leprosy in biblical times, uh, shocker, was terrible, okay? Was terrible, and we're not exactly sure what biblical leprosy was. It's been somewhat described as what we see today in Hansen's disease, okay? Because that word leprosy may have also in included um, other skin diseases and other skin lesions as well. But whatever it was specifically, once a person had contracted it, it was considered incurable. And those diagnosed with leprosy were banned from society until they died. And I know that may sound like a harsh practice, you know, but let's, un let's unpack that a bit. Here's the deal. Early Israelites didn't operate on uh, the germ theory of disease, okay? They didn't operate on that. They did, however, understand that something was, was very interesting about infectious diseases. 
And those suspected of leprosy were kept isolated until their diagnosis was confirmed. And that goes all the way back to Leviticus chapter 13. So, the God, so God in his providence teaches them how to handle these illnesses that would come as a result of living in a fallen, broken, sinful world. And so leprosy had been around a very long time and people were, watch, terrified of getting it. Do you understand the cost of this? They were terrified, terrified. They, they had a fear brought on by a high level of anxiousness and they had almost no compassion toward people who had leprosy. So having leprosy meant that you were unclean, okay? And to touch a leper was to a Jew, a sense of defilement. It was almost as bad as touching a dead body. We don't do that as Jews, okay? For them, leprosy in large part was believed to be a sign of God's disfavor upon you. So I don't know what you did to tick off God, but it must have been bad because you're going to die from this, right? And so those who contracted the disease were removed from their families, their work, and their community. And they would live on the edge or outside the town altogether where they would live in these absolutely terrible conditions and experienced unimaginable suffering, all while living with other lepers. Worst case scenario. And so from... For someone who had leprosy, let me, let me walk you through what biblical leprosy looked like, okay? Um, permanent damage to their skin, nerves, arms, legs, feet, and eyes. Blindness or glaucoma. Disfiguration of the face, including permanent swelling, bumps, and lumps, okay? Sounds like being 14 a little bit, but it's not. It's different, right? It's different. They experience kidney failure, muscle weakness that led to claw-like hands, and not being able to even flex your feet. Permanent damage to the nerves outside of your brain, the spinal cord, including those in the arms, legs, and feet. Leprosy sounds terrible, doesn't it? So unlike today, there was no cure for leprosy and it meant living out the remainder of your days in a truly miserable state. And so for the rabbi, in Jesus' day, for the rabbi, the cure for a leper was difficult, almost as difficult as raising a person from the dead, okay? Because in biblical history, check this out, you ready? This, ready for this one? In biblical history, only two people had ever been cured of leprosy. Bonus points. Anybody know one or two of the names? You get an extra 10 kingdom dollars coming your way. You know, Naaman. Naaman's one. That's my kid. All right. <laughs> good night, folks. Thanks. We had a good one. That was great. And the other one, Miriam. When she was disobedient to God, she had seven days of leprosy as a punishment, which is awful. And so the reality is that for 700 years, for 700 years, there had not been a healing of a leper. And it was thought, it was thought that the healing of a leper would be the sign, a huge sign in the coming messianic age. So if we start seeing lepers getting healed, we know the Messiah is near or here. So here we find Jesus walking into this situation. Jesus is walking along the border of Samaria and Galilee, and he's walking with his disciples, and he comes up on a small group of men who had leprosy. Look at verses 12 and 13 together, gang, in our text. It says, he entered the village. Ten men with leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance, right? They knew, we don't come close to you. Six feet, bro. You know what I'm saying? They didn't come near. They stood at a distance and they raised their voices. They were yelling, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. So, so, the lepers immediately recognize Jesus and they call his name. They immediately recognize him. And what's so interesting is that the lepers ask for pity. They ask for pity. 
Have mercy on us. Have pity on us. Now, this, this makes sense when you understand just how awful their treatment was. They were ostracized. They were uh, excluded from everything. They were cut off from their families, right? And so asking for pity was essentially the state of begging for any help that they could get. Any help that they could get. I mean, they're begging Jesus to literally give them anything, food, clothing, shelter, anything. And they know Jesus has a reputation of what? Compassion, which is something they have not experienced in a very long time. Yet in their desperation, you know what they don't ask for? What? They don't ask for healing. Why? I mean, why not roll the dice? You want to know why? Because it's been 700 years since anyone's been cured of leprosy. Why even bother? Right? Well, let's look at how Jesus responds. Look at verse 14. When he saw them, he told them, go and show yourself to the priests. And while you're going, while they were going, they were cleansed. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, that would have been an incredible moment to witness, just to be a fly on the wall, right? Jesus simply tells these men to go and show themselves to the priest. No mention of whether or not he had healed them, if he was going to heal them, or how he was going to heal them. Really, Jesus doesn't even address it. He just says, go. These men knew that according to the law, that only a priest could certify them clean or healed, right? Only a priest had that uh, power to affirm someone's healing. And so the priest would have to green light their dismissal from, the, from their vacation spot at the leprosy colony and head on home to be with family and friends again. So for these lepers, Jesus saying, go show yourself to the priests, that would have required a lot of faith. That would have required a lot of trust to make this trip to see these priests. No mention of what Jesus is going to do. They just have to now, with great faith, obey Jesus' command. And you know what Jesus did? He rewarded their, everyone say, obedience. Obedience. That's what Jesus rewarded. And so as they obeyed and they were traveling, Jesus healed them in an instant as they were Walking, And there are so many profound lessons for us that are in this singular moment of Jesus' ministry. One that stands out big to me. Okay. Even though we talk about someone who, quote unquote, believes, right? Belief doesn't exist in a vacuum. Do we understand that? Faith is exhibited in what we actually do, not what we say. Faith is exhibited in what we actually do because these lepers believe, they begin to obey, and they begin to what? Go. Let's look what happens next. Verse 15 and 16. But one of them, seeing that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice gave glory to God. Verse 16. He fell face down at his feet. Jesus, thanking him, he was a Samaritan. So all 10 lepers realize that they're healed, but only one comes all the way back to Jesus, praising God for the mercy and healing him. And this brother was so excited. He's so thankful that he comes back with a loud voice. He's yelling. He's so pumped. He's yelling. And I find it interesting that the 10 called out loudly, when they saw Jesus and here comes this dude that we've heard about, he's very compassionate. We can't go near him, but let's scream. Let's do anything we can to get his attention, to get his help, to get his compassion. So they found it necessary to yell when they really needed Jesus' help, didn't they? But only one found it fitting to show his appreciation in the same way that he showed his need. How guilty are we of that? Do we show our appreciation with the same passion that we articulate our need? And he is so thankful. This brother is so appreciative that he throws himself at Jesus' feet as a sign of humility. 
humility. The thankful leopard, thankful leper, may not know that Jesus is the Messiah. He may not know that Jesus is the Messiah. He may not know that this Jesus is the Son of God, but certainly he credits Jesus as being God's instrument, instrument for his healing. He does recognize that. Look at verses 17 and 18. It says, then Jesus said, we're not 10 cleansed? We're not 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Didn't any return to give glory to God except this foreigner? So the surprise in the healing is not that the only thankful one is a non-Jew. That's not the surprise here. Look, the, the mixed group of lepers is made up of both Jews and Samaritans, okay? The, the, where's Jesus at? He's on the border of Galilee and where? Samaria, right? So you're going to find a lot of intermingling here. Of course you are. So that's not the big surprise Look, the reality is their common disease united them despite their deep divisions of ancestry and history and religion. But the only one courteous enough to offer thanks is, in fact, a Samaritan. And while this may be surprising to us a little bit, it wasn't to Jesus at all. He fully knew what the outcome of this was going to be. He full, You think Jesus is caught off guard like, I got all 10 of you guys. And then he's looking, he's like, oh, I thought the other guys were going to come back. You think that caught Jesus by surprise? No. He knew what the outcome, which is why this is such an important event. That's why. The Samaritan thanking Jesus just confirms, just confirms the truth of John chapter one. Maybe you've not read this, but let me, let me read it to you. And I want you to hear, I want you to see now, I want you to make a parallel, right? Listen to what the apostle John writes. He says in John chapter one, verses 11 and 12, he says, Jesus, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be the children of God to those who believe in his name, right? The Samaritan trusted Jesus had faith in Jesus, and was thankful for Jesus. And Jesus knows this and rewards him a second time. This dude gets the hookup on the best day of his life. Look at verse 19. Verse 19. And he told him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has what? Has saved you. Jesus receives this man's faith and rewards it. He says, your faith has saved you. And the other nine, watch, this is so important. Don't lose traction with me, okay? The other nine received a healing, right? But it's a temporary fix. It's a Band-Aid man on a boo-boo. This man received not only an extra blessing, but he received the most important one ever, salvation. That's what he received. Physical healing is just a temporary fix. You know that, right? You understand. A relief to our pain. It's a relief to our suffering. And in some cases, it is an extension of our lives. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm pro-healing. Especially now that I'm just north of 40. Right? I tell you. I'm, I'm telling you, sleep injuries are real. We've talked about this, right. but they're happening more frequently. Physical healing is good. Watch. Salvation is better. Physical healing is good, but salvation is better. And that may be hard. That may be hard to find exceptional comfort in, especially when you're in a miserable state or you're watching your loved ones suffer. It doesn't do a lot of good when someone says, hey, but they're going to be with Jesus. Yeah, I know. I know they're going to be with Jesus. I just don't want it to be now. I get it when we're in a state of suffering and a state of despair. But this is really important truth. If we are as followers of Christ focused, we have got to allow that truth to sink in. Like there needs to be a fundamental shift 
in our ideology when it comes to physical healing, salvation, and death. This needs to sink into our hearts because here's the reality, gang. Not all of us are going to be healed. Not all of us are going to get the miracle that we pine for. We're not all going to get it. Death is the consequence of the fall. I need us to fully grasp that because apart from that truth, it's really hard to make sense of why things are so profoundly broken. Death is a consequence of sin. And it overtakes all of us and most commonly recruits illness as its primary instrument. And so we've got to stop, listen to me, this is really important today. We've got to stop seeing death as the enemy. It's not your enemy. It's really not. For those of us who are in Christ, death is but a momentary breath. It's a transition. It's a heartbeat before we are reunited with the risen Lord. That's what it is. Death is a breath that leads to the next. There is no sting in death because of Jesus' resurrection. Zero sting. And while all of that may be very true, and it needs to be deeply woven into our minds and our hearts, does that mean that we shouldn't pray for miracles? Does that mean we shouldn't pray for healing? Does that mean that the gift of healing no longer exists? I mean, should we really take life-saving measures? Should we try to preserve our life? Did you know that statistically, Christians are more likely to take life-saving measures at the end of their life than non-Christians are? Do we really believe? Do we really believe? Here's the deal. These are really honest and important questions. They, they really are. That's why, <laughs> that's why having a balanced understanding and practice of our faith is critical. We are a culture that, I mean, we love pendulums in this culture. We love pendulums. Having a healthy, robust faith is having a balanced faith, a reasoned faith. Should we accept death as a part of life? Yes. Should we fear death as believers? No. Should we pray when we are sick and in the hospital or needing life-saving measures? Yes. Should we expect God to bend to our will? Absolutely not. So, God can, this is a definitive statement, God can and does heal. God can and does heal. And if the spirit moves, we are to pray for healing, whether for ourselves or for our neighbors or someone we love. But while we pray, we must keep in mind a critical distinction. Although God can heal us, we never presume that he must. Although God can, we should not presume that he must. That's really important. God's wisdom and his sovereign will reaches well beyond our greatest understanding. Do you get that? So we may very well see our healing or the healing of others as a very good thing or even a necessary thing. That person's got kids and man, they've worked so hard to start their business and their elderly neighbors depend on them. Lord, you've got to heal that person. But God sees more and sees better, doesn't he? And sometimes God doesn't remove our suffering. He doesn't heal us. Instead, he works through it. You know, the Apostle Paul writes of his own affliction, right? Many of you are familiar with this passage in 2 Corinthians 12. It says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. And so God responded to Paul's prayer for healing. And by the way, it wasn't like three times, like three just one-off occasions. 
The translation of the word is seasons. That for three long seasons in his life, Paul would pray. Six months, 12 months, three years, who knows? God said, no, no. Instead, he worked through Paul's suffering to draw him nearer to his glory as a testimony to the church. God's grace is far better than anything. And that's what the leper received for his faith. He received a saving grace. That's what he received. And just like Paul, if we are led to pray for healing, then we should pray for healing. If Listen to me very clearly. If any of you are sick, call the elders. We will come anoint you and pray over you. And we will fervently ask the Lord on your behalf. We will beseech him to heal you and restore you. No question. No question. And if someone has the gift of healing, if you're in this body of believers and you have the gift of healing, then use it for God's glory alone. For God's glory alone. Because I personally believe in the gifts. As long as they're exercised within the confines of Scripture and they bring glory to God, let's go. But in the end, in the end, we as believers should not cling to life. Listen, this is really, if you don't hear this right, you could, you could leave here pretty fired up today. As believers, we should not cling to life and make an idol out of it. I don't know about you, but this is true for me. Look at me. I love living. I'm pretty good at it. I've had some great memories and experiences. But I also have days where I really struggle because I wrestle with depression and mental health challenges. And so I, I have to work through those challenges, you know, where some days you, you don't want to be here, you know, but I want to live. So sometimes maybe you're like me and you find this paradox brewing inside of you where life can just be really hard. But in the end, we should not cling to life and make an idol out of it because life is a gift and it can, be a, it can be so joyous. But all that makes life good and worth living is just a taste of what's to come in eternity. I mean, it's just looking at a popsicle, man. You're just getting a taste. Life is worth living, but it's not meant to be worshiped. It's not meant to be worshiped. So what are some next steps we can take from this passage, right? I don't want you to leave more confused than when you came in. Let me give you some. Here's our first next step. You know, Jesus calls us to have a living faith, gang. Jesus calls us to have a living faith. Just as the 10 lepers obeyed Jesus in faith, we have got to learn to trust and take steps even when things are unknown and uncertain. Man, do I wish more Christians would live like that. Why do we need everything spelled out for us? Do you deserve to know what everything? Do you, do you so desperately need that much safety and security that you won't step out in faith to the Lord? Man, we gotta learn to trust. We don't always know how things are going to turn out or how they're going to resolve in life, especially when people are sick or injured. But we must have a faith that displays an active trust and hope. Suffering, praying, longing for God's movement is an opportunity for testimony. It's an opportunity for testimony. I'm going to tell just a quick story. So a few weeks ago, we had some, some very long-time good friends of ours that were here, um, Joe and Kim Strunk. Um, Joe, uh, I had my first youth ministry 1,000 years ago, and I'm serving in, in uh, eastern Ohio. And um, Joe uh, was hired on, and he became the lead pastor. Senior faith became my boss and, and just really needed him. He just uh, kind, compassionate, generous. And, and I, I was none of those things at that very young age, just very like, 
if all of you idiots listen to me, things will be better. You know what I mean? Like that's where we are, you know, when you're young and kind of stupid and headstrong. And he was so good at like just really helping shape and refine me. And I'll I'll never forget one day he was telling a story and tells a story about his mom having to go in the hospital with her uh, 10-year-old daughter, Joe's youngest sister at the time. And they were all just kids. And she's in the hospital. And back then, hospitals worked a little differently. And so she, she was on the same, they kind of shared the maternity floor. And it turns out that um, uh, Joe's youngest sister had a type of leukemia that was going to be terminal. And things were not going well for his sister, and they had to be rushed to the hospital. And, 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 and she's in a room that is separated by just a sheet And on one side of the room, the doctors came in and said, you know, there's nothing more that we can do. And we expect her to pass in the next 24 to 48 hours. And wouldn't you know, they got about 36 hours in and they call the whole family in and they're getting ready to say their goodbyes. And at the same time, they rushed in a a mom that was in having a troubled pregnancy and she was having contractions and she was about to deliver and they rushed her into the other side of the sheet and just about simultaneously as this child is being born, this child's laid to rest. And you know what his mom said? It was dead quiet. And his mom said, the Lord giveth and taketh away but blessed be the name of the Lord. That is an active faith. Heal my child. But if you don't, it doesn't mean you're not good. That's an act of faith. Secondly, Jesus calls us to be a people of gratitude. To be a people of gratitude. I mean, the one, the one man received such an amazing gift and he was healed and he was restored and he was so thankful for what Jesus had done. And of course, we think it's easy to be thankful when something good happens. I mean, of course, right? But what about when things are hard or don't go well? Matthew Henry is a kind of a, like a famous Bible commentator. This dude's been around forever. And he talks about one time he was robbed of his wallet. He got mugged. And he wrote in his diary that night all the things that he was thankful for. This was his reaction to getting robbed, okay? First, he, had, he wrote that he was thankful that he'd never been robbed before, that this was the first time, that up until this time, he was doing pretty good. Secondly, he was thankful that they only took his wallet and they didn't take his life. So he was thankful for that. And third, he was thankful because they only took what he had which wasn't very much. He still had more at home, but what they got wasn't a whole lot. And finally, most precariously, he was thankful because he was the one that was robbed and not the one doing the robbing. Whoa. Whoa. Even in a scary situation, he found gratitude. He found thankfulness. So, so look, 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 look. If Christ, if Christ saving you and securing your eternity is the only thing he ever does for you, would that be enough? Because it should be. It should be. Because that's the miracle we all need. And it's the miracle we all want. Salvation is moving from spiritual death to spiritual life. And last time I checked, it is nothing short of miraculous when something dead comes to life. That is miraculous. And if it's the only miracle that we ever get, gang, it should be enough and it should fuel our gratitude. Because no matter how bad life gets, it's the closest to hell you're ever going to be And when you die, you get to be with Jesus and the saints forever. Now, here's our third and final truth. Next step, takeaway from this text. Here it is. Jesus is 
the healer of our bodies. He is. I know you're sitting there thinking, but you said he might not be. Well, let me explain. It is, it's good to pray and trust that Jesus will heal our bodies and he will heal the bodies of those you love. And here's the reality. My family is facing this right now. Is facing it right now. I spent all last week serving my in-laws, particularly my mother-in-law, who's back in the hospital yet again. And I spent a lot of time praying over her, praying with her, praying for her. I love her so much that I even prayed with a Catholic priest in the room who my father-in-law was so giddy to make sure that that priest knew I was a Baptist minister. So I'm getting side-eyed from old Friar Tuck over here the whole time. But I was committed to praying, committed to praying. And while we've got some really big decisions we have to make as a family, and there's a very long road ahead, I'm still praying for her healing and restoration. But the difference is I'm praying for it to happen in this life or in the next. That's the difference, church. That's the truth about healing. Any healing we receive here, while good, is only temporary. The greater healing is in the next life. So when we pray for healing and we don't get what we asked for, listen, listen, listen. Maybe it's because we don't understand the answer. Maybe it's because we don't understand the answer. What if Jesus says, I heard your prayer for healing and I healed him. I healed them, but I I brought them home to glory where they're they're now receiving their perfect body and now they're, they're free from pain and they're free from suffering. There's no more cancer. There's no more disease. There's no more mental illness. There's no more deformity. There's no more disability. They're healed, man. I heard your prayers. What if that's how Jesus chooses to heal? I want you to pray for healing. I just want you to trust Jesus to work how he sees fit. And if he chooses to work through the suffering, then praise him. If he chooses not to heal, then praise him. If he chooses to heal by bringing your loved one home to eternity, then praise him. And I want to challenge you with this final thought. If salvation is the greatest gift a person can receive, and it's the ultimate miracle, When as much as you're praying for healing, pray more for salvation. Share the gospel. Share the gospel. Ensure, ensure that no matter what Jesus does with your request for healing, you will have eternity to spend with your loved one in glory. Share the gospel. Now, you're not in charge of their salvation. You're not in charge of their conversion. But just do everything you can because praying for their healing is good. Sharing Jesus with them is better. So let's understand these next steps today and let's respond to them. So here is the challenge. Now, all of you have your white label. That is, in fact, a sticker. You'll know that it peels apart. So um, you want to write on the part that's the sticker. We had a little bit of an issue with that last week. But anyway, so just write right on the sticker, okay? Because what we want to do is we want, we want you to see how Jesus is moving in your life in these four areas. So we took all of those requests for Jesus to heal relationship last week, and they're up here on our first healing. We see all the labels there. We see all the labels here of people saying, Jesus, heal our relationships. Now, maybe, just maybe today, you've got someone in your life that you're praying for their healing. Maybe you're praying for their salvation. Maybe you're praying for your healing. Who needs prayer? What are you praying for? Where do you need Jesus to heal? Maybe you need to express your gratitude for how Jesus has worked in your life. So what's the one name, the one word, the one thought that God brings to mind this morning that you can say, Lord, I want to learn to trust you with healing. 
What's the one thing that God stirs in you? Is it for someone else? Is it for yourself? Is it gratitude for how he has in the past? So as we gather around our communion tables this morning, we get to make another awesome exchange. We get to exchange our need, our request, our burden for Jesus to move, and we get to receive the emblems that remind us that he is worth trusting. Because the ultimate pain and suffering in human history was Jesus on the cross for me and you. So Jesus understands pain and he understands suffering. So as you exchange your need this morning, there are baskets at each table, lay that in there, take the bread that represents his broken body, take the juice that represents his shed blood and the ushering into the new covenant, take those emblems and come back and say, Lord, I trust you and I receive you. Do that this morning. I'm gonna pray over you and then you are free to move to any of the stations. You can do business back there, give your offering, whatever you need to do at these tables, make sure you don't miss the chance that you have today. So Lord, help us be mindful and honest about our need. Let us be willing to have our hearts challenged and minds maybe um, willing to think about healing in a new perspective. That Lord, we can come to you and we can trust. You are the great physician, the ultimate healer. But sometimes your answers may not be what we want them to be. And so there needs to be a level of trust in your sovereignty and goodness. And so help us now respond well as we trust you as the healer of our bodies, the healer of our loved ones. You are the healer of our sin. Help us, Lord, respond to you now as we gather around the table, as we remember you through communion and we exchange our need and we receive you. It's in your name that we pray.